Whales stranded two weeks ago in Australia's biggest whales, mass whale stranding event. Now, over the weekend, 55 of those carcasses were towed out to sea and another 30 are going to be buried today along the coastline of Macquarie Heads. But there hasn't, it hasn't been as straightforward as authorities might have been hoping. Uh, four whales have actually resurfaced and re-entered the harbour. Now, this isn't uncommon, and Parks and Wildlife will be dealing with this on a case-by-case -case basis, but they have said that there could be more dead whales floating and reappearing in the harbour in the coming few weeks. I spoke to the mayor, uh, Phil Vickers, he's the mayor of the West Coast, and he said largely the whale stranding hasn't really had that big of an impact. Uh, we're in the second week of school holidays in Tasmania right now, uh, and they've been just as, as busy as usual, uh, people haven't really been deterred at all by uh, the whale stranding that happened there a fortnight ago. All in all, life is largely back to normal for those in Strawn and on the West Coast. Data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics has revealed the number of people taking sick leave has fallen dramatically this year. Absenteeism fell by as much as 40% in some cases. For more on this story, I'm joined by Libby Sander, who's an Assistant Professor of Organisational Behaviour at Bond University. Thank you very much for your time, uh, Ms Sander. Why do you think that sickies absenteeism has declined so sharply? I think there's been a few different reasons. We've seen much less incidence of the flu this year as a result of social distancing and other initiatives to try and reduce the spread of coronavirus. And we've also had a large number of employees working at home for quite an extended period of time. So in this case, they're perhaps less likely to take sick leave if they're feeling unwell. They might feel that they can continue to work at home. And also parents uh, who may have sick children who have also been at home haven't had to take carers leave to look after after them. How much of this decline would you put to the rising unemployment rate? And of course that's certainly a factor. We've got a large number of Australians who are out of work and we know that in 2019 24% of the Australian workforce uh, were casuals and then when you add self-employed into that figure it goes up to 37%. So uh, those people don't have access to paid sick leave so that's quite a significant percentage as well. Uh, because of the threat of joblessness right now, based on your experience, do you think that casual workers are more reluctant to call in sick? Yeah, we certainly know that uh, people who are in precarious employment or casuals, they may not be able to afford to take the time off, so they may be less likely to report sick and actually to go into work, which is, of course, what we don't want them to do uh, in general, but particularly at the moment. And do you think that forced annual leave or unpaid leave due to this pandemic is also contributing to the numbers that we're seeing? Uh, definitely. Where people don't have access to annual leave or if they don't have access to sick leave, uh, then that's an issue. But of course, if people are being forced to take annual leave, as many employees are at the moment, then uh, of course, they're probably not going to be calling in sick uh, and they may have used that entitlement already. And during this time, we've been hearing that people are experiencing uh, greater mental health challenges. Could we see more people take a day off right now for their emotional well-being? Certainly. I think a lot of employees are afraid to do that, honestly, at the moment, because there is a lot of uh, concern about job security and job loss. But potentially, when people start to go back to the office in greater numbers, that will be a significant transition again. And I think mental health is already a significant concern in the workforce, and that has certainly been exacerbated uh, during the pandemic. Uh, in some ways, do you think that the pandemic might have also spurred some workers to action, this sense of, of banding together, uh, even if one's sick, uh, showing up and getting the job done in a time of crisis? Uh, certainly, we know that uh, many people are feeling very isolated, both from their normal routine, family and friends, but from their work colleagues as well. The social support of work is a particularly important aspect that uh, provides satisfaction to a lot of employees. So having that taken away uh, is a significant issue and many employers are reporting feeling quite uh, isolated and very much missing those normal routines. And for those people who are pushing through the sniffles, bundle up at home, under the doona, answering their emails, do you think that this is a case for a more flexible workplace of the future? Does it work? Yeah, we've seen uh, this has gone on for some time now around the world that productivity employers are reporting 
has stayed the same or in some cases has increased on the whole and both employers and employees are looking at how can we make this more permanent. There are a lot of benefits uh, on both sides, reduced commuting, greater well-being for employees and, uh, you know, greater ability to manage work and life responsibilities. And so those things contribute to employees being more satisfied and are more productive at work. So I think we'll see some long-term changes to flexible work practices. And do you think the design of the workplace as we knew it before will ever return? I mean, have we, have we kind of crossed the, that, uh, that, that threshold? Well, we had a lot of uh, employees who were based in open plan offices and that has been raised as a concern uh, during the pandemic. Uh, some manufacturers are now putting in place, you know, perspex screens and putting desks six feet away from each other. Uh, but initial reactions to that haven't been great. And employees don't like the idea of sort of being corralled back into a cubicle type scenario. So I think we'll see the design of the workplace change, that we'll have a smaller head office and more satellite offices and people working from home. Thank you very, very much for talking to us from your home at Libby Sander, their Assistant Professor of Organisational Behaviour at Bond University, sharing your insights. Thank you. My pleasure. People in most of regional Victoria will be able to travel freely to the Northern Territory from November 2nd if coronavirus cases remain low. Now, the four-week time frame will allow authorities to track the regional caseload over two full virus replication cycles. For more on that, what, what this means for tourism operators in the top end, uh, I'm now joined by Annabelle Curtin, who is the owner of Catherine Outback Experience. Annabelle, thanks for speaking to us today. So how do you feel about the opening up of the border to visitors from regional Victoria? Uh, look, for us, it's really exciting. It's a step in the right direction. Um, the Northern Territory has been open since 17th of July for the non-hotspot uh, areas. Uh, we've had zero transmissions. Um, it's been a really good time for, um, I guess, our health authorities here, our government, uh, our operators to sort of road test what that looks like and how that works. And um, I guess we've come so far uh, now, it's a progression in the right direction to open up to regional Victoria, which is exciting uh, for our regions uh, and to hopefully keep moving in a positive direction. And that direction also includes uh, the New Zealand travel bubble inclusion for the Territory. That must also uh, be a very welcome boost for you. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, there's still some way to go. Um, obviously, there's some issues around the flights uh, and what that might look like. But uh, very, very exciting for uh, the top end to be opening up to New Zealand uh, and, and I guess really road testing those protocols that are in place um, from our, our government, but also um, the new way of life for, for our operators, our businesses, the tourists, uh, and that social responsibility we now have that, that will be here for quite some time. Now, you operate an outback station and, and have a number of animals, horses, dogs, cattle, goats on your property that interact <laughs> with visitors. It sounds marvellous. Uh, how has this pandemic made it harder for you to care for your business and your big family over there? <laughs> That's right. It, um, early on when um, coronavirus hit, for us, closing was never an opportunity. We, we have a lot of animals we need to feed and keep feed up to. So uh, we had to make some pretty tough decisions early on um, to continue operating. Our goals uh, for, for this year turned from trying to make a profit, like most operators, to actually breaking even and keeping our staff employed uh, because we need the staff here to help us with training and feeding the animals. Um, it's actually turned into a bit of a good news story for our business. Uh, we diversified quickly, um, bought on services for our local Catherine market, including uh, horse riding lessons, horse riding experiences. Uh, we've taken on a lot more um, horses to train for the local cattle stations. Uh, and through that, we've become incredibly busy and actually doubled our team uh, over the past three to four months. And have you found that uh, in the absence of having visitors coming from uh, different parts of the country and overseas, that the local community has been engaging much more with the Outback experience oh, that you're offering? Absolutely. Um, the local sentiment has been phenomenal. The relationship we now have with our local community, um, again, has been a really positive good news story from uh, what has been a really tough year. And uh, we've had so, so many... Um, 
local travellers from Darwin, from Alice Springs, um, our Catherine local region coming that, that previously wouldn't have come to the local attractions. And a lot of that's been helped by um, the Northern Territory Tourism Voucher Initiative, um, where they would match um, up to $200 by any um, local traveller who put $200 towards it. And that has had a huge, huge, huge positive impact for tourism here in the Northern Territory. And are you able to plan ahead this year or are you really living kind of moment to moment and just adapting your business? <laughs> a bit of both. Uh, a bit of both, absolutely. We, we are chasing our tails, trying to just um, stage month by month. Uh, I guess we've got an overarching plan and then we're just working around how things have changed and progressed and evolved. Uh, and I think that might be the new normal for a lot of businesses for some time to come. So um, we've actually taken our business, which is traditionally a seven month tourist business over our dry season and turned it into a 12 month business, uh, somewhat from necessity, uh, but also the opportunities of having this local market that we didn't previously have at that time of the year. So uh, it's going to be a really exciting time, I think, for uh, the top end uh, and the, the greater Northern Territory um, to actually see tourists coming through in, during our wet season, which is traditionally a time that we don't get a lot of tourists. Um, we're in for a good wet, apparently. So uh, it should be a pretty magnificent year up here. Great to hear. Thank you very much uh, for speaking to us. Annabelle Curtin, owner of Catherine Outback Experiences there in the Northern Territory. Thank you. A group of Indigenous women from North East Arnhem Land say that it's time stories about women's wisdom of country were told in their own words. Five sisters have published and shared their stories about the complexity of sacred songlines or spirals at the Writers' Festival in Darwin. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander viewers are advised that this story does contain images and voices of people who have died. These women have decided they should be in charge of telling the stories of their sacred song lines. Women is wise. Women have to teach her grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren for the law, for the culture. They've watched on as others make observations about their culture and their land. We thought, why not write a book of ourselves and our culture, our stories, our song lines, our country. A lot of these stories have been translated from Yulunga people by old white men. The song lines contain words not often spoken, but have been shared at a writers' festival in Darwin. This is the chance to hear from Yulunga women and our perspective. This tiny homeland of Bawaka on the northeast Arnhem Land coast is central to the stories, which also honour the mother of the authors who used song lines to convey her dying wish. That is a message for us to take her home so that she can die at home and get ready for her journey to her grandmother's country. The women are trying to shine a light on Yungul concepts like Gurutu, the kinship system that spirals through generations. When a child is born, that child goes into that system to follow um, how, how you relate to people. My grandchildren and my daughters and grandchildren and grandchildren and grandchildren, going on and on and on. Their words are also dedicated to a clan leader and grandfather who sang to his granddaughters. He'd sing before we'd go to sleep and he would sing by himself before we all wake up. You might think, I don't really have to understand it because I'm living my own life. It's actually a really powerful and lovely knowledge to have. The women hope this act of sharing will help others better understand the knowledge passed on to them about Yongle life, death and balance. Felicity James, ABC News. There are only about 1,000 people who live in the small town of Kalbar, southwest of Brisbane. But a few more unusual residents have been popping up over the town in the last week. This is part of an annual hay sculpting competition. Anna Hartley went for a look. 
people here in Kalba are pretty creative. For the last week, locals, businesses and even the emergency services have been creating these giant hay sculptures and scattering them across the town. It's part of an annual competition which has had record entries and is already attracting plenty of curious visitors. Some of the town favourites include the local police officer's creation, Don Hale Trump, who of course wants to make hay great again. Everyone uh, sort of likes a good pun uh, these days and especially being a dad, uh, always love a good dad joke. The firefighters are also getting involved and businesses are too, with the local butcher, doctor's surgery and the pub coming up with some pretty fantastic puns. The local childcare centre has created the incredible Bale Hulk. <laughs> And with two weeks still to enter, people are coming up with plenty of new ideas. Kalba has had a pretty rough 12 months with fires, flood and drought hitting the town even before the pandemic. Organisers of the Hay Sculpture Competition say it's a way to bring some positivity back into this community. The entries will be judged later this month on Kalba's annual Country Day fundraiser on October 17. Now turning to sports news is Tony Armstrong out of Melbourne. First of the AFL and another key saint will miss their semi-final.